All right, glad you're with us. And write down our toll-free uh, telephone number. We welcome back live our amazing friends in Philly uh, every afternoon, 3 to 6 Eastern time, right there on the Big Talker, 1210 WPHT. And uh, many thanks to our Philly listeners and the PD there. Uh, there was no bigger Philly Flyers fan than me. Mark Levin thinks he is because Mark loves Philly. But uh, Bobby Clark, Reggie Leach, Rick McLeish, Bernie Perrant, DuPont. I, I mean, these, they were Hound Dog Kelly, Schultz. I mean, they called them the Broad Street Bullies for a reason. You're actually, you came from like. I went to high a school. Poor section. I went to high school on Broad Street. You did go to. I did. It was a pretty tough neighborhood where you grew up. I'm a bully. You're a. <laughs> I wish I was a Broad no, Street bully. I ho- love hockey. Listen, now they're getting to the point where they're trying to take fighting out of hockey. I mean, it's like, oh, it was, it's, everyone gets excited when there was a fight. They they had enforcers. If you went after Bobby Clark. Who was one of the best centers? He had the greatest pictures. If you look at Bobby Clark, he has no teeth. I actually met the former owner of the Flyers. He recently passed away. Ed Snyder was his name. And I'm I'm speaking at some event, and some heckler stands up, and there was there's the Broad Street bullies. He's just stood right. Hey, we didn't come here to listen to you. You can sit your ass down right now. It was great. And the I, one thing you could say about Philly sports is that yeah. they take their sports very seriously. Oh, every town takes it seriously. Everybody. No, no, no. Oh, no I like Philly. Philly well, is, is unto its own. Hey, Philly's, I got to admit, the Phillies are doing really well this year. And uh, I think they they built their team back up. They're well, looking pretty good. With that new sign, I mean, it's huge. Oh, I'm telling you, it's massive. Forget about it. Although I don't think they were happy with the last shot of the Raptors game last night. Oh, my. I mean, it's literally tough. Point two, point one. Rele- he released it in time. Then it's bounce, bounce, score. Four seconds, man. It's game seven. Can you imagine that? What? You know, that's never happened in NBA history before. It's incredible. Never. Not one time. Well, I was watching it. I'm like, no way this is going in. No way. <laughs> no way that's going in. Uh, anyway, Philly, we welcome you. Uh, we're always glad to have you with us. And uh, for you in Philly, it's uh, 800 Sean, if you want to be a part of the program. All right, we got a lot coming up in the course of the program today. I'm telling you, there is there's something percolating that's going to happen, I think, sooner than later as it relates to the biggest abuse of power corruption scandal in American history. It's all lining up, and it doesn't matter what the rage Trump psychotic media does anymore because, oh, oh by the way, Felicity Huffman pled guilty. We already knew that. I guess she's coming to some type of plea deal. She's the only one, though. Oh, that's, okay. that's the story. Well, she was smart. She, You know what? She paid the least amount of money, and then she fell on her sword, admitted she was wrong, and came out with, I thought, was a sincere apology. And all these people that are just, it, it's so clear they did it, and they're, like, insulting everybody's intelligence. The DA in that case literally said, Okay, if you don't cut a deal with us and you're going to push this any further, we're going to give you more charges, which they did uh, to Lori Laughlin and these other people. I mean, it's kind of weird if you take a picture of your kid's face and put it on another kid's body and say, oh, my kid does crew, but they never did crew once in their life. Um, And I don't think there's going to be any jury that's going to be sympathetic to the reasons, the whys, or some type of explanation. I didn't know what I was doing with my $500,000. I don't think they're going to buy it. Hers was a little different, though, because what she did was she actually paid the proctor. Right. So she basically said to the proctor, here's money. If they screw up, please right. make the changes, yada, yada. Yeah, well, um, I, but I don't know what she, look, whatever she ends up getting, maybe it's just a fine Maybe probation. Saying a couple of months potential in prison. Okay. Maybe. Maybe. Other people, they're getting years. And I think that who's ever advising them, it's like there's there's certain times in life you just got to say, okay, own it. I'm not saying, look, they deserve due process, the presumption of innocence. We're not like the rest of the media. We don't rush the judgment. 
I guess they can make whatever defense they feel they have to make. But from my perspective, what we've learned doesn't look good. It's like the Jussie Smollett case. You got two eyewitnesses saying they were part of that scam that Jussie Smollett got beat up by, quote, MAGA Trump people. And then you got the videotape of the two guys buying a rope and a red hat that were used in that incident, so they claim, and Smollett is still just clinging to the whole thing. Now, maybe because of Kim Fox, the prosecutor, remember, a grand jury indicted in that case. That was a pretty simple grand jury decision. And then she just decided not to prosecute, but then there's federal charges that he potentially faces in this, so I don't think it's over for him either. And it's like, but he's holding steady. At some point, it just, you know, with my kids, it's the same thing. You know, every kid is going to do stupid things. My kids will never reach the level of stupidity that I had in my life. They just won't. And I, but it's like, fine, you make a mistake. I always say to my kids, okay, you made a mistake. You do it again. Now you're making a choice. It's not a mistake the next time. The next time you've made a choice in your life. And similarly, you know, especially young, I I swear I didn't do it. I did not eat the cookie. I did not eat the cake. Meanwhile, there's chocolate icing all over their face. The evidence is right there. You didn't have one bite of the cake. No, dad, not a single bite. Really? And uh uh-huh. And what's this on your hands? No, it's it's poop. It's chocolate icing. It's poop. Um. Making a flare could have been vanilla. I don't know what you're going to call vanilla. <laughs> Shaving cream. Um, oh, is that what it is? Uh, it doesn't smell like poop and it doesn't smell like shaving cream. Uh, looks like chocolate icing from that chocolate cake that you just took a bite out of, which I told you not to. I don't care that the kid eats the cake, but did you eat it? Yeah. Own it. Just admit. And sometimes I'm like, you're insulting my intelligence. You're making me now punish you for lying. Not going to punish you for having the cake. I am guilty of wanting cake, too. Everybody sees a cake and they want to eat it. That's why I have no cake in my house ever. Because if there's cake in my house, it's not going to last more than 30 hours. Well, 30 seconds, to be blunt. Just like Linda with the Sherry's Berries. Oh, so many people love but the shimmer sugar. I was so sugar. honest. You sat I ate there. every single one of them. You right sat there you. and ate eight double boxes of Sherry's berries that were supposed to be given to everybody. Listen, life is short. Eat a berry. You didn't buy, you didn't. Did you pay for any of them? Here's a the lie. They were presents. I'm a mother. Uh, oh, they were presents. Who bought you eight boxes? People. People. You want to name them? Very friendly people. One, one group of people. The Sherry's berries people. <laughs> And Thank you were supposed to share nice. them and let everyone else try them. I sent them to many, many friends and family members. I know. Um, now what's happening with the deep state is getting really fascinating. Now, remember, you got Nadler and company. They want to demand that the attorney general of the United States sends over the totally, completely unredacted version of the Mueller report. Well, he's already sent over, and there's up to now only three people that I've confirmed that have gone over to read the unredacted Mueller report. That would be Lindsey Graham, Mitch McConnell, and Congressman Doug Collins. Now, by saying it's unredacted, there's still two full and seven partial lines of the Mueller obstruction report. In other words, that was it. And everything else... They can see the Department of Justice, Nadler's committee, they're asking them to break the law. Now, they can go over and see the whole. It's just a show. It's just an act. It is just an attempt to stir the pot and create resentment and blame and create a false narrative and caricature about the attorney general. And it wasn't just the attorney general. It was the Office of Legal Counsel. And it was Rod Rosenstein. And they t- it took them maybe five seconds to figure out there's no obstruction. And Nadler, who never wanted the Star Report release, which, by the way, the independent counsel law mandated, there were 11 specific felonies listed in the Star Report that were committed by then-President Bill Clinton. 
It was a reason he got impeached. No such thing here with the Mueller report. You got FBI files showing that Clinton aides were learning as, look, we've got the IG report is coming out on FISA abuse. There's no doubt that there was FISA abuse. We learned last week, great reporting, John Solomon, that in fact, Christopher Steele was on a deadline. And Christopher Steele met with the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, a woman by the name of Kathleen Kavalek. She put out a written account of the meeting with Christopher Steele and sent that account to the FBI long before, 10 full days before, the FBI used the bulk of the bought and paid for Hillary dirty Russian disinformation dossier. So they had a warning on that level and closed door testimony in August of 2016. Again, before the October FISA application, Bruce Orr warned everybody at the upper levels of the DOJ and the FBI that one, Hillary paid for it Two, Steele hated Trump and had a political agenda and three, uh, nobody verified it. And then we find out later it's an unverifiable dossier anyway because under oath in Great Britain in an interrogatory, Steele himself couldn't corroborate his own dossier and said, I have no idea if any of it's true. And they did it because they wanted to get Trump. They did it because they wanted to spy on Trump. And they did it at, at the expense of our Constitution, rule of law, they were willing to lie and they conspired because it was all premeditated to commit a fraud on the FISA court judges. They did it not once, but four separate times. Andrew McCabe, the deputy FBI director under Comey, even said no, no dossier. There's no FISA application that never would have passed. No judge would have approved it if they would have told the FISA court judge, oh, Hillary paid for it. The guy that put it together hates Trump. And we haven't confirmed or verified or corroborated any of this thing. Uh, no judge would have given them the FISA application or approved it. It says at the top of the FISA application, verified. We now know it's unverifiable because the guy that put it together doesn't believe in it. And these documents reveal the FBI allowed this phony dossier of, of Christopher Steele to guide the FBI Bureau's operation against Trump. I want to know what impact it also had on the Mueller report. Because Andrew Weissman, according to Orr, was one of the people briefed in August of 2016. What part of this did he know about? Now that we know they knew ahead of time, now the question is, okay, why would they lie to the FISA court? Why would they violate the constitutional rights not only of Carter Page, but of everybody in the Trump campaign? To me, if you're really going to be fair, equal, and just, any convictions associated with any of this was made in false pretenses and phony evidence, and there was entrapment. And don't forget all the spying that took place when they empowered Stefan Halper with the help of, now we know from new revelations last week, the blonde flirtatious bombshell to go after Paige Papadopoulos and Sam Clovis. All right, we got a lot to get to today. Glad you're with us. Uh, Jason Chaffetz, uh, we expect the Horowitz report could be this month or at the latest early next month. What's up, everybody? Linda from the uh, Sean Hannity Show here to talk about your money. Retirement, your money, it's like your health, right? You know, you don't think about it until you don't have it. And a lot of people are making really bad mistakes, especially with their retirement. They're not retiring with enough money. And you know what? It's just wrong. But have no fear. Meet one of the most incredible financial minds in America, Dr. Richard Smith. And Richard's extraordinary tools are trusted by thousands of Americans. It tracks over $20 billion in the stock market. And his tools can help you reset your retirement. You're going to be hearing a lot from Sean and me about Richard. And literally, we have never endorsed any financial software tool until now. Why? Because we've never seen anything like this before. So see it for yourself. Go to Hannity.com retirement. That's Hannity.com forward slash retirement and check it out. Last year, you wrote an op-ed uh, saying Democrats don't take the bait on impeachment. You said that if it were a, seen as a political or partisan exercise, it simply couldn't work and, it, and that Democrats shouldn't pursue it. Is it getting to the point where you're going to have to change your mind? 
Well, you know, I was arguing a year and a half ago when I wrote that op-ed that we ought to wait to see what Mueller reports. Now, we have the Mueller report now, although we still haven't heard from the man himself. And I think the first priority has to be get Mueller before the Congress and the American people. You convinced that's going to happen? I am convinced it's going to happen. Uh, that is inexorable. The American people have every right to hear what the man who did the investigation has to say. And we now know we certainly can't rely on the attorney general who misrepresented his conclusions. Uh who is that at this point? It's Adam you know, Schiff. I mean, Schiff is just the, he's been the biggest liar. He's full of Schiff. Now, I have a dossier on on Schiff, our own Hannity built-in dossier. We got one on Nadler. We got one on Congresswoman Maxine Waters. And, and we didn't pay a foreign agent. We didn't funnel money through a, you know, Perkins Cooey type of group to... Fusion GPS to hire I thought foreign nationals were we actually take their own words that they've been lying about for the last however many years. And I'd like to invite these people on. We'll give them three straight hours and we'll go over every lie that they told and every false promise that they made and every conspiracy theory they, they advanced. And uh, the only person that I know we have definitive proof of collusion on. Well, I think Hillary's pretty close, but. You know, the Russian dossier gets right there. But the only person that's on tape doing it is, well, the cowardly ship himself. And I don't know why the cowardly ship won't come on. Say that three times fast. We'll continue. Hey, guys, it's Linda, the executive producer for The Sean Hannity Show. You might also know me as Sean's daily sparring partner, and now that he's a ninja, of course. And every day we argue about all sorts of things and talk about lots of stuff, including the incredible economy that the president has given everyday Americans. And just like that, well, we want to tell you about how to fight for your retirement. And that's right, fight. There's a huge crisis in America. Millions of people are retiring and without enough money. And if that's not shocking enough, even if you think you've got your financial act together, chances are there are retirement killers out there that you don't know anything about. So have no fear. We have one of the brightest financial minds in America to help make sure your investments for your future retirement are on the right track. I'm talking about Dr. Richard Smith, the founder of Trade Smith, and his mission is to help Americans be more financially literate. That's right. Put the power, put the knowledge back in your hands, make better investment decisions and avoid catastrophic mistakes that could cause your retirement to be a disaster that could cause your retirement to be a disaster. Thousands and thousands of people trust Dr. Smith's investment tools to track over $20 billion in the stock market. And I'm telling you, you should too. When we're talking about your retirement, you're in a financial fight for your future. Please do yourself a favor, folks. Register right now for Dr. Smith's special online event, The Great Retirement Reset. Go to Hannity.com forward slash retirement. That's Hannity.com forward slash retirement. Eliminate the stress. Eliminate the worry of investing in the stock market. Register now, HannityNow.com forward slash retirement. Of course, you will face pressure to compromise on things that matter most, perhaps even to trade virtue for the appearance of virtue. But you should exercise caution when circumstances tempt you to disregard principles. As Robert Mueller once said, there may come a time when you will be tested. You may find yourself standing alone against those you thought were trusted colleagues. You may stand to lose all that you worked for, and it may not be an easy call. All right, that was Rod Rosenstein. I guess he gave a commencement address somewhere, and uh, quoting Robert Mueller. There's, look, there, there's happening something happening that is pretty amazing. Uh, this was at the University of Baltimore School of Law, where he made those comments. Well, but. You you can see this now with the closed door testimony that has been released. You know, we now have struck and paid saying, well, we didn't rig Hillary's investigation. That was all being handled by the attorney general, Loretta Lynch's office. We know Lynch wouldn't let Comey call it an investigation, but a matter. We know she met with Clinton, Bill, on the tarmac just days before the decision was being made whether to indict Hillary. It wasn't this was a slam dunk indictment. You know, but they had classified top secret information in a mom and pop shop bathroom closet server known as Platts Rivers Network. Then, of course, then they have the intention. Everyone talks about the intent necessary to get an obstruction case. Well, there has to be an underlying crime. The underlying crime was 18 U.S.C. 793, the, the Espionage Act. And then, of course, the intent was to destroy the evidence. And that attempt was made by destroying and deleting 33,000 emails and then 
bleach bit the hard drive, so there's nothing there that can be recovered forensically. And just in case, if you know, take your Blackberries and your iPhones and bust them up with hammers and, and remove the SIM cards. Um, we're getting a little back information about what actually happened uh, in terms of the FBI files that are now slowly leaking out, thanks to the Freedom of Information Act. But we saw that aides to Hillary Clinton, they were on high alert now, this just came out in the Washington Examiner, where on in January of 2011, now Justin Cooper, who was the man that oversaw, was overseeing Secretary of State then Hillary's home-based email server, sent a warning to Uma Abedin. Quote, I had to shut down the server. Someone's trying to hack us, and while they did not get in, I didn't want to let them have the chance to do so. I'll return. Restart it in the morning, he said, in a 2.57 a.m. email. Aberdeen writes, OMG, oh my God. Replied at 7.05 uh, that, that next day. Now, early the next morning, Aberdeen wrote to the State Department officials, Jake Sullivan, Cheryl Mills, Clinton's chief of staff, do not email Hillary Rodham Clinton anything sensitive. I can explain more in person. The sense of alarm that you got with Clinton's staff appear in these partially redacted documents released by the FBI that this past week that were part of the Bureau's midterm mid-year exam was which way they called the you know that Operation Crossfire Hurricane for Hillary it's just the mid-year exam that's all it's it's just everything was now it's Operation Boomerang anything sensitive I can explain more in person she says but it, it was obvious a sense of alarm with Clinton's staff um, impartially redacted documents released by the FBI that were part of the Bureau's mid-year exam investigation. Now, remember the Freedom of Information Act request. Remember, there was a test. We got this from Judicial Watch. And when the FBI tested just 40 of Hillary's emails that were recovered, four of them had top secret and classified information on it, and there was a feeling among those FBI agents, those that care about the law, rank and file, that were not part of this upper echelon abusing their power, the 99% of good people, they were shocked that four top secret classified emails were found and they only sampled 40 and you got 63,000 total. But they were only supposed to be about a wedding, a funeral, yoga, etc. That's what Hillary said at the time. Anyway, in handwritten notes of an interview in March of 2016, FBI agents wrote that Cooper asserted that a hack was never confirmed, but the debate over whether Clinton's server in the basement of her home in Chappaquiddick, uh, New York, remains alive today. And don't forget the Platts River Network one. But the debate over whether Clinton's server in the basement, you know, is just part of this. Now, that followed a report uh, last fall that a Chinese company did successfully hack into the server at one point the fbi believed and i'm sure they were probably right that at least six foreign intelligence services hacked into her server in the mom and pop bathroom closet you know this is why Steele's story falls apart because if the, the fbi story where you know of, of a federal court about an asset christopher Steele, you know is is just it's torn apart because we have new memos and John Solomon's been at the forefront of unearthing these show high ranking government officials meeting with Steele in October of 2016. This is when that Christopher Steele met with this woman that worked at the Department of State, the Assistant Secretary of State Kathleen Kavalek. And her observations were recorded exactly 10 days before the FBI used as the bulk of information the FISA app, in the FISA application, Hillary's bought and paid for Russian lies. That still doesn't stand behind. It means they never verified it. They knew Hillary paid for it, and they knew Steele hated, hated Trump. We have now two examples of that. And why that wasn't a big part of Robert Mueller's investigation, considering he had time for taxi medallions, loan applications, taxes, FARA violations, is beyond any understanding I have because he had a, a wide mandate which could take him anywhere that he wanted to have. And the FBI pretty much blatantly lying about Christopher Steele to the FISA court. Oh, no, no, he's been a great source in the past. Well, he was fired for lying and leaking. 
And then even after the fact, he was in contact, we now know from Bruce Hoare's notes, trying to pass on information to the special counsel and to Robert Mueller. And documents reveal that the FBI allowed Steele's false intelligence to guide their operation against Trump. We broke that report in the last week and a half. The F- that Christopher Steele planned to release his unverified dossier. Remember, BuzzFeed eventually did, but that was in January. But portions of it were the more salacious parts at times were released to the Washington Post and David Korn and Michael Isikoff. And that information had been disseminated to the American people for the purposes of influencing the 2016 election. The whole story about Trump and Russia, Ritz and hookers and urinating on beds. When did you first hear about that? It was pretty much out there for a long time. Not true, but it was out there. So, you know, as we get to know more information, we begin to see a very even a darker picture emerge where all of this was planned out. And in spite of all the knowledge they had, that they weren't going to stop. And Nunez, the uh, House Intelligence Committee member, he's the ranking member now, former chairman of the House Intel Committee, suggesting now that Comey is in serious legal jeopardy. He reacted to this town hall that Comey did on fake news CNN, and he said this is a guy who continues to just take a, make a mockery of the entire FBI and Department of Justice. I think one of the reasons Rod Rosenstein mentioned Mueller and not Comey is because, well, because Rosenstein didn't agree with Comey and agreed that he should have been fired. And he also agreed that there was no obstruction in any point. And, you know, for Nadler threatening to subpoena a a reluctant Mueller, I think the president, because that's all part of the executive branch, now that the president, he never invoked executive privilege. They encouraged every White House employee to go speak to Robert Mueller in these congressional committees. It cost a fortune for those people that were working in the Trump White House. And they did it anyway. And then they handed over 1.4 million documents and the president answered written questions. You can't cooperate any more than that. In fact, the president now is invoking executive privileges because now this is the fifth separate time that they're looking into the same issue. And at some point, this becomes harassment of, you know, the presidency in general. Lindsey Graham is saying that one key document will blow the lid off the entire Russiagate hoax scandal. He was uh, on this weekend and, you know, he dropped a pretty tantalizing hint yesterday about the developments and he talked to Maria Baratiromo, and he talked about this one document connected to the Steele dossier could lift the lid or blow the lid off the entire Russiagate hoax scandal. He said there's a document that's classified that I'm going to try and get unclassified that takes the dossier, all the pages of it, and it has verification to one side. And Graham told Baratiromo that there's really no verification other than media reports that were generated by reporters that received the dossier. This is, again, they were acting like they were separate sources. By the way, a van crashed into a fence near the White House. Hey, listen, to get into the White House, it's pretty much a fortress. You don't get in that easy. So we got to see if Graham can get to the bottom of that. The bottom line is the dossier was never independently confirmed, but it says right on the top of a dossi- of a, a FISA application verified. Now, DeGeneva is swearing that Horowitz has determined that the FBI FISA warrants were obtained illegally. Joe DeGeneva is one of the most connected people I know. And he said this to the Washington Examiner. He said, Michael Horowitz, we have learned, this is DeGeneva, smart guy, has concluded that the final three FISA extensions were all illegally obtained. The only question now is whether or not the first FISA warrant was illegally obtained. I would argue that had to be illegally obtained because they used the bulk of information being the Clinton dossier and they were all warned ahead of time. The news in the last week probably changes that story. And Mueller, by the way, is stonewalling on the identities of the private investigators that he hired for the Russiagate probe. I wonder why. Uh, Well, Lindsey Graham, rightly so, is telling Donald Trump Jr. to just blow off the subpoena in the Senate, what is, I, what, what is Senator Byrd doing? How many more times do we have to investigate one thing? This is a Republican. How many more questions can you possibly ask somebody that sat there for 30 hours? 
Anyway, that Graham says if I was Donald Trump Jr., I'd tell him you could you don't need to go back into the environment anymore. You've been there for hours and hours and hours and nothing's been alleged uh, that changes the outcome of the Mueller investigation. It's time to call it a day. He's right. And the president took a swipe at the FBI director Ray for protecting Russia probe gang. I have no idea. What, what is Director Ray doing? Every time I hear him speak, he never talks about the corruption that was in the FBI. We're not talking about the FBI. The FBI is the premier law enforcement agency in the world. But that one-tenth of one percent is destroying its reputation of the 99.9 percent that do everything right. So we'll see what happens there. James Baker has actually admitted the general counsel. Now, he's the one guy that thought that Hillary should have been indicted and said so. He's now admitting he's nervous what the DOJ inspector general is going to find as it relates to FISA abuse because he was involved in that decision. Anyway, here's what he said. How nervous are you about the IG? Uh I'm always nervous about the IG, I guess. But I mean, no, they, they're coming in after the fact to look at what we did when we were trying to do it in real time and having the having the pressure to try to deal with these threats as they were coming. I look, I've had a great relationship with the Office of the Inspector General at the Department of Justice for literally decades now. I've been investigated or the in matters that I've worked on have been investigated many times by the Inspector General. It's not a pleasant process. Uh, it is it's just not. But the, the People are pleasant, but the process is not uh, the most enjoyable. Uh, but it's what we need to have in the system. We need to have the Inspector General's office to make sure that the American public, the courts, the Attorney General, the rest of the government, Congress, have confidence that the enormous power that is entrusted to people at the FBI and the Department of Justice is used wisely, appropriately, lawfully, efficiently. And so you know, I welcome the accountability. They will, I'm sure that they will find things that I didn't know at the time, maybe that others didn't know at the time. Uh, and, you know, I just don't know where it's going to go. Unbelievable. All right. Now, we have a lot more to get to. We have Congresswoman Tlaib. Oh, her comments. Oh, they're just priceless. It's something really, really ugly. We talk about the rise of anti-Semitism in Europe, but it's right here. And no Democrat had the courage to call out Congresswoman Omar. And then you have Talib on this podcast saying, oh, there's a kind of calming feeling. I always tell folks when I think of the Holocaust. Huh? I mean, and then Pelosi invited an imam that is a radical to give, I guess, the opening prayer of, uh, to Congress. I'm like, uh, this guy, by the way, posted an image on social media supporting the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, This guy in 2014, during the conflict with Israel and Hamas, Hamas, by the way, in their charter calls for the destruction of Israel, he posted, God willing, on this blessed night, as the third Antifada begins, that the beginning of the end of Zionism is here. May Allah help us overcome the monster, protect the innocent of the world, and accept they're murdered as martyrs. Huh? What is going on with the Democratic Party? Anyway, 800 941 Sean, if you want to be a part of the program. All right, when we come back, a lot of news we're going to get to. We have a congressman, two congressmen are going to join us. Then later, Jason Chaffetz uh, will talk about the media corruption and Congresswoman Tlaib, and we'll look at the 2020 candidates as well. The big scam of the whole address was that there's a crisis. There's not a crisis. Folks, the president has manufactured one heck of a political crisis for himself. Donald Trump is manufacturing a national security crisis. You will hear them say Mm -hmm. is that this is a manufactured crisis. It's not a national security crisis. It remains a Seinfeld shutdown. Seinfeld presidency. uh, All about nothing. What happens when there is a real crisis, when there is a real emergency? Does he take to the airwaves? Do we give him the airwaves? Do we believe him? Some question if there is a crisis at all, as the president has claimed. There is not a crisis at the border. It's a manufactured crisis for the president to get a political win. Crisis can have, as we see now, a very elastic definition. He's determined to convince you there is a crisis at the border, even though an intelligence official tells CNN, quote, no one is saying this is a crisis except them. 
President Trump must stop holding the American people hostage, must stop manufacturing a crisis. This president just used the backdrop of the Oval Office to manufacture a crisis. This is a manufactured crisis. No crisis exists, and anyone making the argument is most likely guilty of fear-mongering and willfully misleading the American people. Locals will tell him on the border, even conservatives, is that there isn't a national security crisis. The notion that we have a crisis there, a security crisis, is absolute nonsense. This is a manufactured crisis, and a crisis that uh, manufactured by the Trump administration. This uh, artificial crisis of the president isn't going to justify his uh, appropriating money for a wall that Congress is unwilling to give. Is there a crisis at the border? The president said there's a humanitarian crisis at the border. Is there? Absolutely not. We have a challenge. All our humanitarian issues are challenges for us. I voted, like, unlike most Democrats, and some of you all like me, I voted for 700 mile fence. But let me tell you, we can build a fence 40 stories high unless we change the dynamic in Mexico. And, and, you will not like this, and punish American employers who knowingly violate the law when in fact they hire illegals. Unless you do those two things, all the rest is window dressing. Now I know I'm not supposed to say it that bluntly, but they're the facts. They're the facts. I'm the guy who wrote the law that set up a drug czar. But let me tell you something, folks. People are driving across that border with tons, tons, hear me, tons of everything from byproducts from methamphetamine to cocaine to heroin. It's all coming up through corrupt Mexico. The president also said today that um, former presidents have said to him that they wish that they had built a wall. Do you I recall President Obama ever one. saying that? I can't think of a single one who said that. Certainly not President Jimmy Obama. Jimmy Carter. George, I mean, Ronald Reagan. Um, how you doing? Uh, George W. Bush. Um, George H.W. Bush. President Obama. President Obama. Come on. So you don't buy we, it. We need border security, but that's not the border security we need. All right, the battle of the border now. Glad you're with us. Hour two, Sean Hannity Show, is now evolved into the 2020 narrative of radical extreme socialist Dems. Now you have Biden wanting to pay for health care for illegal immigrants. This weekend, Kamala Harris, well, she says you're going to take away no more independent health insurance. That affects 188 million Americans. But those Americans that can't buy their own health insurance, you will help pay for illegal immigrants' health care. You can't make this up. And she has now joined her rivals, including Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders, uh, over the weekend in favoring free health care. Nothing is free. That means you will pay for it. Just like uh, Kamala Harris pledging to criminalize private gun sales via executive action. And uh, Biden's rivals now in the Democratic race rejecting his uh, middle ground, as he calls it, on climate change. Well, Biden, you know, Senator Biden said he supports a 700 mile wall and says there's tons of drugs coming across the border. Uh, Then, of course, we got the new Joe Biden. The wall is not the border security we need, which Joe Biden is, you know, speaking on any given day. Of course, it's all related to the base of the Democratic Party having gone solidly left, you know, just like a newly resurfaced 2007 quote, Biden blamed bad schools on african-american students the daily call the daily wire put this up and uh, when biden was asked by the washington post at the time about the discrepancy in school performance in iowa compared to schools in dc he said well there's less than one percent of the population of iowa that's african-american and there's probably less than four or five percent that are minorities what is washington what's there So, look, it goes back to what you start off with, what you're dealing with, he told the Washington Post. And then he goes on to discuss dysfunctional homes in the minority communities and suggesting minority mothers don't talk to their children from the time that they're born. And I'm like, who makes these type of broad, sweeping, insane and ridiculous, you know, generalizations? You have children coming from dysfunctional homes when you're, have kids coming from homes where there's no books. A mother from the time they're born doesn't talk to them. 
as opposed to the mother in Iowa who's sitting out there and talks to them. Wow. I mean, this is outrageous. The kid starts with a 300-word larger vocabulary at age three. Half this education uh, gap exists before the kid steps foot in the classroom. What? On top of his views on, on segregation that we have pointed out. This is all coming out on Crazy Uncle Joe. It's, it's He's got a lot to answer for, not the least of which is his position uh, on his uh, son and leveraging a billion U.S. dollars in Ukraine. And I'm leaving in six hours. You fire the prosecutor that is investigating my son or else. Anyway, joining us now, Congressman Andy Biggs of Arizona and Art uh, Del Queto is with us. Uh, thank you both for being with us. And uh, also Duncan Hunter is with us as well. We have three people. It's not. Oh, well, this guest sheet is supposed to be in front of me. That's why I didn't know Duncan Hunter was joining us. Sorry, they, welcome all of you. So the the battle of the border, I mean, you could really just sum it up in Joe Biden, senator, saying he supports a 700-mile wall because all the drugs coming across the southern border, and Joe Biden now saying, oh, that's not going to work. How do you explain that, Congressman Biggs? Well, I explain it this way. The Dems have now decided to focus on preventing President Trump from getting any kind of political uh, victory. And, and uh, they don't want to de- derail their impeachment efforts. They don't want to derail their uh, uh, their efforts to sully him. So they're going to pretend that this crisis, because it is a crisis, it is an emergency, simply doesn't exist. And, uh, and so they're out there making wild statements, and all the while, uh, people are pouring across here, record numbers, drugs coming across, human trafficking, and and that's just simply the way they're viewing it. And what's your take, uh, Art Del Cueto? No, that's that's what it comes down to. Look, I'm not here to to root uh, or cheer any certain political party uh, on its own. I've said it many times before. Well, you've been a member of the Border Patrol since 2003. You grew up in Arizona, right along the border. I've lived here my whole life, and I can tell you right now that what we're experiencing right now is nothing like we've experienced before. We have record number of people coming across. We have drugs coming across. We have children that are being used uh, for these uh, smuggling organizations for, so they can you know, ultimately come into the United States and claim some type of asylum and be released in the United States. And it, we're at a point now where I don't understand all these individuals that keep saying it's not a crisis. They need to figure it out, and they need to understand that uh, they better start doing things for the American public and doing things for their constituents instead of for illegals and criminals that are coming into the country. That's what it basically comes down to. Is your love for this country going to be enough? Or are you more concerned with your hatred towards a a, a certain president? And that's where the problem is. Because I'll tell you what, President Trump has been on point. Uh, I mean, I don't want to sound like a cheerleader, but it's hard not to. He has been uh, right on point with everything we need on the border. Uh, You have individuals like Andy Biggs, who is on this, uh, this phone call right now. He has been down to the border numerous times with myself. He's brought other congressmen with him. Uh, I mean, we're not lying. We're basically telling the facts. It's not the right side facts or the left side. It's just the facts. Let me go to Congressman Duncan Hunter, because I also want to get into another issue, and that is the case of Eddie Gallagher. Uh, My sources have told me that there is video evidence in that particular case, uh, Duncan, that shows that the allegation against Eddie Gallagher, that somehow he had killed an innocent person that the video confirms that he was actually giving this i guess combatant a tracheotomy to save his life is that true yeah that is true and i brought the the, uh, video out from san diego brought it out here to dc last week and i i showed it to more than half a dozen members of congress that have worked on this with me and talked to the president and and they did this without ever seeing the video or the the uh photo evidence the video and the photos show Eddie and two other Navy SEAL corpsmen providing first aid to, to a, a ISIS terrorist. Hey, and, and Sean, back to the uh, the border issue with the military slant, it, it seems right now that all the Democrats that hate the military are very upset that the president's using $1.5 billion that they've been able to scrounge up out of a $700 billion 
DOD budget to secure the border. Uh, I, I think the easiest argument here is we're, we're fighting in places like Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria while we're being overrun here at home. If it's not the military's job to protect our borders here and to use that Department of Defense money to secure the borders here so we're not overrun at home, um, then I don't know what the Department of Defense is doing. That should be their number one priority. It shouldn't be helping out other countries. It should be securing the border here because border security is national security, period. Well, I mean, if we don't get this done, I, th- I think one of the reasons, and you guys correct me <clears throat> if I'm wrong, is, you know, people from Central America see exactly what's going on. And the, the president is serious. He just got another, what, $1.5 billion from the Defense Department that had previously been designated for the war in Afghanistan and other projects. That's an addition to all the other money that he's put into the wall. And the president's moving forward, making the repairs, building the wall, and the world seems to see it. And as a result, it seems like people have determined that this is their last opportunity to get in easily. Well, yeah, Sean, I, I think uh, so, too. Uh, go ahead, Andy. Go ahead, Duncan. Yeah. Uh, well, well hey. what's happening is there's two things. They're trying to get in before the fence gets up. But they're also, don't forget there's, that there's, this is organized, there's advertising, there's incentives to get here anyway. So even when you get a fence up, unless we correct the asylum laws, people are going to get on our, on our right of way and they're going to start saying, hey, look, I want asylum. And uh, we, we're not holding them. Uh, we're, we're letting them loose. And that's getting through there. That's the incentives through the grapevine that goes all the way down into Central America where people say, oh, yeah, you can get in there. Um, but they're hurrying and they're coming up, and we've got to we've got to get going on the fence. But we also Congress has an obligation to get going on the on the asylum laws, and um, and we need to also make sure the executive branch gives immigration slash asylum officer authority to uh, our border patrol agents to help stop this asylum crisis. Duncan, you were going to add. Yeah, no, he's absolutely right. And uh, you, you got to build the fence so, so you have a barrier. And it's the president's executive privilege to secure the southern border. You don't need a you don't need to pass laws to be able to secure the southern border. That's the president's prerogative. But it is it, it is on Congress to fix the asylum laws, to institute e-verify so that people can't hire illegal aliens. Um, that that is our our job. That's not going to happen with the Democrat Congress. So the, the president right now needs to do everything he can using his executive power to bypass Congress, because that's what you got to do right now with Nancy Pelosi running things, and do everything he can to secure well, the we've, border, move money to secure the border. We've cited legislatively the law states, especially as it relates to drug trafficking corridors on the border of the United States, that the president has the authority to build barriers and put up lighting. Uh, I've read the law 15 times on this program, and I would also argue And again, that's legislatively, but constitutionally, uh, the president is the commander in chief. And when you have 4,000 homicides in two years and 30,000 sexual assaults in two years and 100,000 violent assaults uh, committed against Americans by illegal immigrants, that's about the safety and security of our entire country. This is how bad it is right now. Uh, So we we have so many individuals that are coming in. President Trump lowered the numbers with rhetoric alone. And then soon after these people saw that nothing was happening, they could claim asylum, they'd be released, the numbers started going higher and higher. Now they're higher than they've been before, but it's not just Central Americans. I was recently in El Paso, and in under an hour that I was there on the line, uh, over 200 Cubans turned themselves in. So other countries are now understanding, hey, just cross, say, say those words of asylum. They're so overwhelmed and our, and our holding cells are so overrun that we're just releasing a lot of these individuals. So what that's causing is we're removing agents from the line to take care of these processing centers. Now you're leaving gaps on the line, which the drug traffickers are very, very much aware of. So mm-hmm. when you start looking at effectiveness and you start looking at our numbers of apprehensions are higher. You have to remember, yes, they're higher, but they're getting released. And then you've got to go to the second thing, which worries me much more. All right. I want to thank you all for being with us. Congressman Biggs, thank you. Uh, Art Del Cueto, thank you, sir. Appreciate you being with us. Duncan, thank you. 800-941-SEAN. Uh, we'll check in with Jason Chavitz. Uh, he's got some insight into Horowitz, Hoover, the deep state, and how much trouble, how many people are in for the biggest abuse of power scandal in history. 
All right, the latest on deep state corruption. When we get back, Congressman uh, Jason Chaffetz joins us. We'll talk to him. You know, and the media, do you think they've learned a single thing, anything from this experience of perpetuating lies, propaganda, misinformation? No, nothing. And you sent a letter to uh, the Honorable Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, uh, as well as Michael Horowitz. What are you looking for from from the Secretary of State? I want the Secretary of State to give me all documents related to the 11th October meeting between Christopher Steele and a member of the State Department. The lady in question took notes about the meeting. And in her notes, she indicates that Steele was urging to get the dossier out before the election. And she also, in handwritten notes, Uh, indicates that it was paid for by the uh, Democratic Party, the Clinton campaign, the dossier. The most important thing is she transferred that information to the FBI. So the FBI is now on notice on October the 11th that their confidential informant is trying to get the dossier out for political purposes and that the State Department figured out the Democrats paid for it. How could they then go get a warrant based on that same document and not tell the court what the State Department told them. Well, in terms of the Horowitz report, uh, I'm I'm hearing that a big portion of that will be about the media being complicit because what they did was they created stories, they leaked it to the media like Yahoo, like Mother Jones, and then those companies reported it, published it, and then they actually, the FBI used those same stories that they leaked in the first place as evidence to get the the, the FISA warrant to, to spy on American citizens. There's a document that's classified that I'm going to try to get unclassified that takes the dossier, all pages of it, and it has verification to one side. There really is no verification other than media reports that were generated by reporters who received the dossier. So the bottom line is the dossier has never been independently confirmed. It was used to get a warrant. They knew the author of the dossier was on the Democratic Party payroll. He hated Trump. They got the warrant anyway. Most Americans should be upset about that. I'm very upset about it, and we're going to get to the bottom of it. How nervous are you about the IG? Uh, I'm always nervous about the IG, I guess. But, I mean, no, they're coming in after the fact to look at what we did when we were trying to do it in real time and having the having the pressure to try to deal with these threats as they were coming. I Look, I've had a great relationship with the Office of the Inspector General at the Department of Justice for literally decades now. I've been investigated, or the matters that I've worked on have been investigated many times by the Inspector General. It's not a pleasant process. Uh, It is, it's just not. All right, 25 now till the uh, top of the hour. Uh, That was Lindsey Graham, uh, and I want Pompeo to give me all the uh, documents related to the meeting with Christopher Steele and now the John Solomon story that we have been breaking now for the last week that, in fact, this woman that worked at the State Department, Kathleen Kavalak, had met with Christopher Steele uh, on a couple of occasions, and she wrote down the specifics of that meeting, and this was all sent to the FBI— all sent to the Department of Justice, all about who Christopher Steele was, that he had a political agenda and a deadline, and it was still the bulk of information that was used from the Hillary Russian dossier that even the New York Times now believes could have been disinformation, Russian disinformation from the beginning. Uh, They did it anyway. Now, that's on top of the closed-door testimony of now, we now know Bruce Orr, who warned everybody also in August of 2016. Hillary paid for it. Steele hated Trump. It's not verified. And Lindsay then talking about trying to declassify a document that shows the Steele dossier verification. Well, we know it's an unverifiable document because Steele doesn't stand behind the own, his own document. Then, of course, that was the general counsel, the last cut of James Baker, uh, and testimony he gave. Yeah, I'm always nervous about the IG report. Well, I think he should be. Uh, now, the Department of Justice Inspector General is apparently homing in on the FBI use of this unverified steel dossier as the bulk of information to use to get the FISA warrants. Remember, McCabe himself said no FISA, no dossier, no FISA application. And uh, with us now is somebody who knows an awful lot about this, Fox News contributor, former congressman, congressman from Utah, uh, Jason Chaffetz is with us. He's the author of the book, The Deep State. 
Um, now, I know you know Horowitz. I know you've dealt with Horowitz. Um, I'm not trying to be insulting in any way, but he does take an awful lot of time considering he has like 600 people working for him to get this information out. I give him credit. He's the one that found the page and struck uh, uh, text messages. No help from Robert Mueller, by the way, who could have had it all and then cleaned their phones. But um, you know the inspector general well. Where do you think we are with as it relates to this investigation into FISA abuse? Well, thanks, Sean. You know, one of the reasons it takes so long is they don't get the internal cooperation from the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Remember, Horowitz had to actually go to the Pentagon to write code to actually go decipher the text messages, which now revealed literally thousands of text messages between Strzok and Page and others. So that those types of gyrations in writing code with the Pentagon to get into the FBI system itself is what he's up against. Um, uh, the other thing I would note that people forget about is the already published IG report documents and details how FBI personnel were accepting gifts, tickets, meals uh, from the media in order to get these stories out there and planted. And that seems to be a two-way street and I think will be a, a big part of this FISA abuse. And that story of how these FBI personnel were inappropriately interacting with the media and accepting gifts. How is it, if it's an unverifiable document, as I suggest it is, because Christopher Steele, when under oath in an interrogatory in Great Britain under the threat of perjury, when he was pushed on the dossier, said, I don't have any idea if any of it's true. It's uh, it's raw intelligence. I don't know, maybe 50-50. Right. But then, if you go to the Nunes memo, the Grassley-Graham memo, they say the bulk of the applications were the dossier. Now we know two separate instances. This State Department employee by the name of Kavalak had warned everybody after meeting with Steele that he was on a political witch hunt against Donald Trump, pretty much. And then the or closed door testimony, but they used it anyway. So wouldn't that be a conspiracy to commit fraud on a FISA court? Yes. And you add on top of that, Sean, that John Ratcliffe, the congressman from Texas, who is on Intel, he is on the House Judiciary Committee. He's one of two people that I know of that has fully read the unredacted FISA application. And one of the things he said publicly is at the very top, it says verified, in all capitals, verified application. That is just a flat-out lie from everything that we know, all the documents that are starting to flow out now. And, and you're right. You highlighted the fact that if there was no dossier, there was no FISA application. And, and so I, the other name that I think we should throw out there is this guy Mark Elias. Mark Elias sits in the middle of this. He worked for Hillary Clinton. He worked for the DNC. He's the fixer there. He's an attorney. And the guy sits in the middle of all of this, and I think it's a name we're going to hear more of in the future. Okay, what about other people? But, you know, this is really important because we, a year ago, May, one year ago this month, Rod Rosenstein was on a panel, and this is what he said about a FISA affidavit and a FISA application and a warrant. Listen the to way this. we operate in the Department of Justice, if we can accuse somebody of wrongdoing, we have to have admissible evidence and credible witnesses. We need to prepare to prove our case in court. And we have to affix our signature to the charging document. That's something that not everybody appreciates. Uh, there's a lot of talk about FISA applications. And many people that I, I see talking about it seem not to recognize uh, what a FISA application. A FISA application is actually a warrant, just like a search warrant. Uh, in order to get a FISA uh, search warrant, you need an affidavit signed by a career federal law enforcement officer who swears that the information in the affidavit is true and correct to the best of his knowledge and belief. Uh, and that's the way we operate. And if it's wrong, sometimes it is, if you find out there's anything incorrect in there, that person is going to face consequences. Well, that person is going to face consequences. Now, we know Comey signed one of the FISA applications, the first one. Is that correct? Yeah. And we know that Sally Yates one. and uh, uh, Buente signed FISA warrants. Is that correct? I'm not sure of all the signatures on there, but these are some really high-ranking people. And then the last application, the third renewal, the fourth warrant, was signed by Rod Rosenstein himself, was it not? Well, and that's why I think Rosenstein, you know, I, I, on the one hand, I want to pat him on the back for his service. But on the other hand, the guy had conflict. And how does he sign this document? Any cursory look at this, and they know that the Steele dossier 
steal with somebody that the FBI had already put on a list as somebody they wouldn't do business with. And yet they used this dossier. Well, to me, Congressman, what would happen if I committed a fraud on the court? What if anybody in this audience uh, knowingly presented information that wasn't verified? And I, I didn't know that until you had told me last week that the word verified is at the very top of this whole thing. Well, we would make arrangements for your wife to visit you on some Saturdays in the penitentiary, Sean, um, and maybe send you some letters. But you'd be locked away in jail, and you should be if you had done that. Okay, so we expect, according to the Attorney General, this is what we have going on. The Attorney General made it clear to Lindsey Graham that he's looking into the investigation into Hillary, which even Strzok and Page are saying was rigged, and they were part of the rigging it themselves, but they're, they're actually putting the blame right in the office of the Attorney General under Obama, which would be Loretta Lynch. Uh, then, of course, we've got these FISA warrant applications. Then we've got other spying go- going on vis-a-vis Stefan helper going after Paige and Papadopoulos and Sam Clovis and bringing in blonde flirtatious bombshell spies with him. Is that legal to to allow that to happen? And do you believe there's a possibility that our intelligence community, not the rank and file 99 percent that are good, but maybe the Clappers and the Brennans of this world maybe outsourced uh, some work to our allies because it's illegal for them to do it themselves to spy on Americans? I'm glad you brought that up because uh, I I really do think this story will go to Clapper and Brennan themselves. They have been so tenacious in trying to fight this back. I think they're playing defense. I think they're projecting the fact that they potentially could have been heavily involved. And why did a lot of this happen overseas? A, they didn't think Hillary Clinton was going to win, and B, they thought they could hide it better over there. So the Inspector General report can only focus on Department of, of Justice assets, but they've got to be working with the Inspector General within the IC, it's called the intelligence community, to also uncover this. And that's why you also need the cooperation of the State Department. I've met with people to State Department. Every time you meet with them, they take notes. So I do believe that John Solomon's story to be very true. I agree. We'll take a break. More with... Uh... Former Congressman Jason Chaffetz of Utah, now a Fox News contributor and Hannity fill-in, uh, which, by the way, I, I'm, I hear you're doing so good I might be out of a job by Tuesday, but, you know, whatever. They still have to pay yeah, me. I, I, think, I think you're pretty safe, Sean. I think you're pretty safe. All right, so we know everything that's coming. Do you believe that those people that signed off on the phony FISA application, that they never verified that was unverifiable, that they knew Hillary paid for, that they knew was put together by somebody who had an agenda against the opposition party candidate, do you believe that these people should be charged and will they be charged? Should they be charged? Absolutely, they should be charged. I'm buoyed up. I'm I'm more optimistic than I was uh, when I was on your show a while ago and expressed some pessimism. And that is because I think Attorney General Barr is the real deal. He's been there, done that shown a backbone. I don't think he gives a crap on what the national media says. And I think if somebody truly did wrong, he will hold them accountable. And I think there'll be some of the names that you and I and others have been talking about. I also think there's probably two or three names out there of people we've never heard of that were in the bowels that were actually doing these things in a very nefarious way. And I do hope they're prosecuted. All right, let's talk about the next step. If we're really going to have equal justice and application of our laws, does that mean that Barr is right? If the investigation into Hillary and the Espionage Act and the email server and the deleted bleach bit busted up devices uh, obstruction, do we have to go there or are we basically just giving her a pass again? You should go there. You know, there are reasons why we have federal election law. Remember, all of this happens uh, primarily overseas because of the millions of dollars the DNC and the Hillary Rodham Clinton campaign are flowing into it. You can't just launder money and do those types of things. I mean, they're worried about Donald Trump in some 20 minute know nothing meeting. How about the millions? It's more than, I believe, $10 million that's flowing overseas to do this crap to lay the foundation for these bogus applications. I, I, they've got to go after that. Yeah. All right, Jason Chaffetz, thanks for being with us. We'll see you uh, some point this week on Hannity, the Fox News Channel. 
When we come back, uh, yeah, the media cannot let go of their lies, their conspiracy theories, their obsessions. It's 24-7. Hate Trump, rage Trump. And they can never, ever admit they're wrong. That's just, that's just impossible. Quick break. Right back. We'll continue. It's the Sean Hannity Show. News Roundup is next. Stay right here for our final news roundup and information overload. You support uh, the Medicare for All bill, I think, initially co- co-sponsored by Senator Bernie Sanders. You're also a co-sponsor yes. on it. I believe it will totally eliminate private insurance. Um, so for people out there who like their insurance, well, they don't get to keep it? Well, listen, the idea is that everyone gets access to medical care and you don't have to go through the process of going through an insurance company, having them give you approval, going through the paperwork, all of the delay that may require. Who of us has has not had that situation where you got to wait for approval and the doctor says, well, I don't know if your your insurance company is going to cover this. Let's eliminate all of that. Let's move on. I want to ask you about something you said that night. You said on stage with me in January that when it comes to private insurance, quote, let's eliminate all of that, let's move on. Yes. Now you later said we don't need to get rid of all private insurance. So. But let's clear what, that. What, what, Jake, which is, which okay, is it exactly? We were, well, we were together. Yes. And you'll remember and roll the tape, please. Yeah, we can roll the tape. <laughs> that, well, you support uh, the Bernie Sanders bill, which essentially gets I rid of insurance. I support Medicare for all, but I really do need to clear up what yes. happened on that stage. Okay. It was in the context of saying, let's get rid of all the bureaucracy. Let's get all of the waste. Oh, not the insurance companies. No, that's not what I meant. I know it was interpreted that way. If you watch the tape, I think you'll see that there are obviously many interpretations of what I said. What I meant is let's get rid of the bureaucracy as it relates but the bill to Medicare, gets rid of insurance. But, but no 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 it does not get rid of insurance it does not get rid of insurance and 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 listen and let me just tell you where i am let's okay. tell you where i am all right i support medicare for all it is my preferred um, as a policy. principle you mean not bernie sanders bill i support the bill okay i support the bill well, I su- the bill gets rid of private insurance for everything that it doesn't is, get rid for, of supplemental for, insurance right for, for cosmetic surgery but for all so it doesn't get rid of all insurance okay it doesn't get rid okay. of all insurance right. but for all essential health care benefits but, you, but why ask the question why the question if the answer to that question is because medicare for all and the vision of what it will be includes an expansion of coverage. So Medicare for all will include vision. It'll include dental. It'll include hearing aids. So you support giving universal health care, Medicare for all to people who are in this country illegally? Let me just be very clear about this. I am opposed to any policy that would deny in our country any human being from access to public safety, public education, or public health, period. So what is your vision uh, for a one-state solution that meets both uh, uh, Palestinian and um, Israeli or Jewish national aspirations? Absolutely. And let me tell you, I mean, for me, just a few, uh, I think two weeks ago or so, we celebrated... um, or just it took a moment, I think, in our country to remember the Holocaust. And there's, you know, there's a kind of a calming feeling, I always tell folks, when I think of the Holocaust and the tragedy of the Holocaust, and the fact that it was my ancestors, Palestinians, who lost their land and some lost their lives, their livelihood, the human dignity, um, their existence in many ways have been wiped out and some people's passport. I mean, just all of it was in the name of trying to create a safe haven for Jews post um, the Holocaust, post the tragedy and horrific um, persecution of Jews across the world at that time. And I love the fact that it was my ancestors that provided that, right, in many ways. Um, But they did it in a way that took their human dignity away, right? And it was forced on them. And so when I think about a one state, I think about the fact that why couldn't we do it in a better way? Where, and, and I don't want people to do it in the name of Judaism, just like I don't want people to use Islam in that way. It has to be done in a way of values around equality and around the fact that you shouldn't oppress others so that you can feel free and safe. Why can't we all be free and safe together? What is this calming feeling that Congresswoman Talib is talking about when referring to her thoughts about the Holocaust? Uh, and the the mass slaughter of six million plus human beings and, you know, and the impact on the politics and uh, the ancestral home, homeland 
of the Jewish people is Israel. That's not even an issue that is in dispute. And, uh, you know, it's 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 pretty shocking that, you know, this keeps happening with the new extreme radical modern Democratic Party. And, you know, remember the the state of U.N. partition plan was 1948 and the day that Ben Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel, reached out his hand in general peace and neighborliness and they were attacked the next day and they were attacked in 67 then 73 and they are under rocket fire attack uh, almost on a weekly basis and then some um but i mean it's it's beyond understanding then we move to kamala harris joining her rivals in favoring free health care for illegal immigrants that now is a staple i guess of of those on the left and Harris saying, take uh, away Americans health insurance and make them pay for illegal immigrants health care. And then secondly, pledging to criminalize private gun sales via executive action. I mean, it's it's they've gone off the rails, the whole party. Anyway, here to react to it, not stuff that the mainstream media is too interested in covering. Apparently, uh, Joe Concha, he is a fellow host on uh, WOR, the news and talk in New York, New Jersey, and Long Island, uh, every weeknight right after this show airs. And then, of course, uh, a frequent guest on Hannity. How are you, sir? And works for The Hill. What's going on? Well, besides feeling like we're living in Seattle than New York, I think we're doing okay. <laughs> When's this yeah. rain ever going to stop here in New York? Hannity, my God. Tell me about it. It's ruining. Nuts, but uh, to, your, to your point. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. It's ruining. It's ruining my already bad golf game. The few times yeah, I can I play. Before. You shot a 54 on, what, nine? Yeah, I was about to say, the front nine. You took away my punchline. Thank yeah. you, man. <laughs> yeah, but it, look, all those clips you play, I, I would think the happiest person on the planet, when you hear a Joe Biden or Elizabeth Warren or Kamala Harris or Tlaib or even Ocasio-Cortez, who are the last two aren't running for president, but they represent where the party is, is President Trump, because it gives him such a clear contrast between this is what socialism looks like, this is what the far left looks like, and then this is what my record looks like and what I want to accomplish in four years. So, look, I, I think from at least a political perspective, uh, these sort of ideas only benefit the president. If you look at every poll, for instance, Sean, when it comes to providing health care to illegal immigrants, an overwhelming majority of Americans, not just Republicans, but independents, even Democrats, say that's a very bad idea because that will destroy our economy. And by the way, there's this thing called the emergency room that if you ever have any sort of emergency health problem, that you will be treated regardless of whether you're illegal or not. So it's not like people are dying in the streets. You do have that access. But I remember on WOR, and thanks for mentioning the radio show, when Joe Biden said that last week, we took calls on it and we had Democrats calling saying, you know, this is the type of thing that is going to force me to vote for President Trump coming from Democrats because they think it's such a radical idea and so bad for the country. And it's not where we are right now as a country. Well, why would Nancy Pelosi, after the Omar comments, now the Tlaib comments, and by the way, not the first for either of them. uh, But I guess when it comes to bashing Israel, it looks like Omar and Tlaib, they have a very high uh, a friend in high places because uh, as Representative Lee Zeldin was on Fox and Friends on Sunday, he said that the House Speaker Nancy Pelosi made a bad call by allowing a Texas imam with a history of anti-Semitic comments to deliver the noon prayer in the House of Representatives last week. Uh, why would she allow picture, that? Yeah, yeah I, look, the, the picture it this way. Let's say uh, a President Trump allowed that same imam to m- make those comments uh, before a luncheon then suddenly you'd see a lot of media coverage (laughs) put you around that it's simply a matter of variables if one person does it whether it's pelosi whether it's Tlaib, they tend to get passed because well you know in Tlaib's case she's a minority she's a woman she's a freshman so she's still learning her way all the excuses are made but then if a republican says the same exact thing then you have a completely and totally different reaction and that's why so many people don't trust the media anymore because there's no consistency in terms of coverage because it's all based on what letter well, wait, but nancy in pelosi in, invites a guy that, that posts an image on social media supporting the muslim brotherhood now remember the, the mohammed morsi yeah. who was once the head of egypt he was a former head of the muslim brotherhood who once referred to jews as descendants of apes and pigs and he was rewarded with billions of dollars in obama biden cash and and military equipment uh 
in this particular case, you have this imam that Nancy Pelosi brought in that, you know, he's he's posting images supporting the Brotherhood. In 2014, during a conflict between Israel and the terrorist group Hamas that has in their charter the destruction of Israel, he posted on Twitter, God willing, on this blessed night as the third Antifada begins, the beginning of the end of Zionism is here. May Allah help us overcome the, this monster and protect the innocence, uh, innocent of the world and accept the murdered as martyrs. And the following years, you know, shows a video purporting to show conflicts between Palestinians and Israeli soldiers with the comment, want to know what it's like to live under Nazis? I'm like, wow, uh, what has happened to this party here? Yeah, and, and you would think that Nancy Pelosi would be besieged with questions as far as how can you allow this to happen. And I don't get this, by the way, and maybe you can answer this for me, Sean, but the last couple of elections, and particularly in 2016, how do Democrats get 71 percent of the Jewish vote, given that Republicans obviously are much more? I mean, you, you can't even compare the two in support of Israel. I, I don't know the answer to the question. I, I, I don't get it. But, but but I can tell you that this hatred and the rise of anti-Semitism in Europe and now obviously the U.S. is real. This is this. This oh, is completely is. I mean, look at what's happening in synagogues, right, in San Diego and Pittsburgh. It, right. It's scary. It, it, it's getting bad. And and uh, that that and the Democratic Party, considering the comments that are coming from the Tlaib of the world and Nancy Pelosi keeping these people on committees, not punishing them in any way, speaks volumes. Because hey, those are actions, right, that she could take. Uh, that, that that's certainly something they should be questioned about a lot more. But as you said, we're just not seeing it. We're not seeing it at all. All right. So, uh, of all the 2020 candidates, who do you see emerging as the leader? I mean, some people say Biden, but I think Biden between China and Ukraine and his son. You know, how did his son, who has no experience whatsoever in the in the type of equity dealings that he ended up doing in China when he flew on Air Force Two and his father, um, how does he do a, a deal worth those hundreds of millions of dollars? How does he go to Ukraine? He's under investigation by a prosecutor there. And Joe Biden holds American tax dollars hostage until the guy that's investigating his son gets fired and gives him six hours to do it. And they did it. Some of those are all questions that Joe Biden should be asked. But have you seen Joe Biden even sit down for anything resembling no. a tough interview yet? He no. did the view, and that's basically the extent of it. So, yeah, he seems to be playing like, well, you know, I'm 34 points ahead in some polls in terms of, in which I find incredible, by the way, because Biden, honestly, I've said this before, I'll say it again. I don't know what that, what's at his core. What are his principles? Who is Joe Biden? He's been in politics for four decades, and I don't know who this person is. So when I hear that he's a centrist, but then I hear that, like we talked about, Bill allow undocumented immigrants uh, free access to health care, unlimited, and then you say, well, wait a minute, that's a pretty far left idea. So do I think he'll emerge as the nominee? I don't know. He's never done well as a candidate. He's not particularly a good speaker, but I think once he has well, to... Well, maybe Neil Kinnock can, you know, down. write him a speech again and he can plagiarize the whole thing as he did before in one of his earlier runs. All right, stay right there. Joe Concha with The Hill, WR Radio in New York. You know, it's funny because I don't see anybody stopping that have been lying, caught lying for over two plus years and advancing conspiracy theories and hoaxes. And I don't see any sign that they changed their ways. I, I just see signs that they're doubling down on the same conspiracies with absolutely no justification. They're not doing any investigative work into the deep state and the abuse of power where the evidence is now becoming overwhelming and incontrovertible. Uh, they seem now to be sort of transitioning well what can we get trump on now let's let's demand the irs get his taxes now we're going to weaponize the irs and turn that against the trumps and their entire family and anybody that likes them uh so i guess the media is just going to continue to be the liars that they are it's the pivot sean right couldn't find anything on russia collusion so let's find collusion between say trump and bill barr in terms of a cover-up in the one percent of the Mueller report that hasn't been uh released the part that's been redacted that can't release because you know that would be illegal because it's grand jury testimony so if it isn't russia then that was never something that uh, many in our media genuinely cared about they cared about the means to the end which was that could be used to remove the president and now the taxes seem to be a, a very big deal but as you saw last week sean that New York Times story about how he lost more than a billion dollars from 1985 to 1994, that had zero impact. In fact, I think it made the president look good because everybody loves a comeback. And the fact is, 
that he admitted that he lost billions or billions, excuse me, on The Apprentice. He admitted it in his book. And there was tons of press coverage because I've lived in New York my whole life. New York Daily News, The Post, The New York Times documented very well what was going on at that time. He, in says, it in his, he says it in his own voice. He's told the story many times. All right. Uh, all right we'll have more this week. Uh, thanks, Joe Concha. You'll hear him on about a half hour from right now on uh, New York's WOR. Uh, quick break. We'll come back. Wide open phones as we continue the Sean Hannity show. No public evidence that the vice president, former vice president, took any inappropriate action to help his son. But was it right for Hunter Biden to take a job like that in Ukraine while his father was engaged in diplomacy there? Uh, I don't know the circumstances uh, in which he took the job, uh, but I can say this vis-a-vis Joe Biden. Uh, there's no evidence, nor has there ever been any evidence, that he was doing anything but trying to get the Ukraine government to crack down on corruption. Uh, we're providing generous support to Ukraine. We're providing defensive weapons to Ukraine. We want Ukraine to be successful in its conflict with Russia. But part of that is having a government that the people of Ukraine are willing to fight for and protect. Uh, and they've had an endemic corruption problem. That's what Joe Biden was trying to address. Uh, so going after his son is just a, a, a method of going after someone the president believes is his most formidable opponent. So, yes, let the president go after him. But don't seek the help of a foreign government uh, in your election. Um, and, you know, if this isn't criminal uh, and Bob Mueller said he could not prove all the elements of a crime, then maybe we need to change the elements of that crime because we cannot make this the new norm that if you can't win an election on your own, it's fine to seek help from a foreign power. You heard the president right there. He says you all are going to elect him in 2020. That's not going to happen, and I don't think this country could uh, survive another four years of a president like this who gets up every day uh, trying to find new and inventive ways to divide us. Uh, He doesn't seem to understand that a fundamental aspect of his job is to try to make us a more perfect union, Um, but that's not at all where he's coming from, and he's going to be defeated. Uh, He has to be defeated because I don't know how much more our democratic institutions can take of this kind of uh, attack on the rule of law. Last year, you wrote an op-ed uh, saying Democrats don't take the bait on impeachment. You said that if it were a, seen as a political or partisan exercise, it simply couldn't work and, it, and that Democrats shouldn't pursue it. Is it getting to the point where you're going to have to change your mind? Well, you know, I was arguing a year and a half ago when I wrote that op-ed that we ought to wait to see what Mueller reports. Now, we have the Mueller report now, although we still haven't heard from the man himself. And I think the first priority has to be get Mueller before the Congress and the American people. you convinced that's going to happen? I am convinced it's going to happen. Uh, that is inexorable. The American people have every right to hear what the man who did the investigation has to say. And we now know we certainly can't rely on the attorney general who misrepresented his conclusions. All right. There is the cowardly shift on with, I guess, George Stephanopoulos so over the weekend. Um, I got to tell you, these people have all lost their minds. They've all it's it's it's, it's like invasion of the body snatchers on every level. I mean, the only guy that we have on tape colluding with Russia is is the cowardly Schiff. Why doesn't he or Nadler or Maxine Waters or any of these people take us up on our invitation? Why are you failing in your mission as you're, the you're right. executive I am, producer? I am failing to miserably. Get, you are. I mean, look, I've told you to get them on the show. You're I've right. repeated it. I've offered them a ton of airtime. Why won't they come on this show? I guess because I suck at my job. I'm going to try my best to get better. Well, I want to know what they're saying to you. Oh, they don't respond. Well, you call their office. It goes to voicemail. You know what I'm going to do? Why don't you say you're from MSNBC? I'm going to say I'm Olga Buseva. I'm going to call Adam, (laughs) and I'm going to say, Adam, it's Olga. Olga Olga How are you? So listen. Mm -hmm. And what is the nature? Uh, what's the nature? They're very of the, important materials. Uh, materials. Very, very important materials. What, what is the na- what, what is the nature of the uh, of the materials? I also uh, have naked pictures. Uh, and naked the, the, the naked Trump. Naked Trump. Uh, did Vladimir hear about it? Uh, Vladimir knows. I have naked. Yeah, Vladimir but of course, uh, Vladimir. He look every day at the naked pictures of Trump every day. And uh, we also know who was a mediator between Trump and Russian government, who met with uh, ex advisor of Trump. Uh, Mr. Flynn, it was a Russian singer, very famous singer, Arkady Ukupnik, who met with Mr. Flynn on uh, Brighton Beach in Brooklyn in a special uh, Russian cafe, Langeron. What's the name of the cafe? Uh, uh, Langeron. Langeron? Yes, it's on the Brighton Beach. Okay. And uh, it's a special, when, when... it's a Russian district in uh, Brooklyn. And do you know what was discussed? 
they discussed many things, but the most interesting thing is they use a special, they use the special password uh, before before their meetings. When they met each other, they said, "Weather is good on Deribasovskaya." Weather it rains is good. Yeah. In where? Weather is good on Deribasovskaya. There is a name of a street in Odessa. Did you did you hear? Yes, I did. Uh, so it's a street in Odessa. Uh, yes. And the, the code word is weather is good on Deribasovskaya. 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 Skaya. Okay. Yeah. And I'll have my staff follow up to get spellings and and more details on. Yes. That. And the second part of their best word was uh, it rains again on Brighton Beach. It rains again on Brighton Beach. Yes. On that meeting, Ukupnik told Flynn that uh, all those compromising materials will never be released if uh, Trump will cancel all Russian sanctions. Okay. Um, well, obviously, we would uh, welcome a chance to get copies of those recordings. Um, so we will try to work with the FBI to figure out, uh, along with your staff, how we can obtain copies of those. Okay, and so Buseva met with Trump uh, in in uh, New York at some point after the 2013 Miss Universe uh, yes. pageant. Absolutely, and she got uh, compromising materials on Trump after their uh, short relations. Okay, and, and what's the nature of the compromise? Well, there were pictures of naked Trump. Okay, mm-hmm. and so Putin was made aware... Uh, of the, the availability of the compromising material? Yes, of course. Uh, Buzova shared those materials with uh, Sobchak, and Sobchak shares those materials with uh, Putin because she's a goddaughter of Putin, and Putin decided to press on Trump. Um, and, uh, and the materials that you can provide to the committee or to the FBI, uh, would they corroborate this allegation? Sure, of course. Uh, when they were in Ukraine, we got their conversation by the phone where they discussed those uh, compromising materials. We are ready to provide it to FBI. So you, you have recordings of both Sovchek and Buseva uh, where they're discussing the compromising material on uh, Mr. Trump? Absolutely. I'm just going to tell them that I have pictures of everyone naked. And that if he wants to see them, he should come on this show. And I t- I'll tell Nadler I have all the uh, evidence, and then I have personal conversations with uh, Mueller on tape. And I'll tell Maxine she can have I, all the time she I wants. I got to tell you, it is pretty scary that they just keep doubling down on dumb and stupid. They really do. You know, maybe I should be the one eating fried chicken because I think these guys are scared. Oh. I don't think the Democrats oh, need they to be eating that was, fried yeah, chicken. They, because they wanted Barr to go, two things they want out of the Attorney General. The first one is why they hold him in contempt, because he won't break the law. You're not allowed to give over grand jury information. But there is plenty of time if these people get out of the comfort of their, of their meeting rooms, walk over and see the unredacted Mueller part. And the only thing that's redacted is part of... What, seven lines and one line? Let's That's talk it. about the real problem here for the American people. All right, you talk about... Talk Let me about. talk about that. Let's talk amongst ourselves here. So the, the Mueller investigation cost the American people $25.2 million, took over two years. We investigated everybody and their mother, their cousin, their uncle, their uncle's friends. It was ridiculous. And now that they have nothing better to do, instead of doing what is actually needed, which is work that would help the American people, like, I don't know, lowering taxes, better health care opportunities, they have to keep this alive or there's no way they're going to win 2020 because the 29 million people they have running don't have a thought between them. So the only thing they have is the Mueller, is the Mueller Council. That's it. That's all they have. This is the case that they're going to ride their little uh, their ships on all the way through 2020. And they're going to sail right into the night because Trump's going to spank them. Okay, then. Let's get to uh, Kurt in Utah. Kurt, how are you? Glad you called. KNRS, the home of Crown Burger and Rod Arquette. You can't get a better combination of uh, Crown Burger. For those of you that don't know, they put pastrami and a ton of cheese on this burger. It is unique like no burger you've ever had before. How are you, Kurt? Do you go to Crown I'm Burger? I'm doing good, sir. I do. Many uh, times. Yeah, I know. I, there's only one Crown Burger. You have it. I don't have one. 
Well, you need to come back out to Utah, and I'll take you to lunch. I'd love to do that. Anyway, what's going on? Hey, I'm uh, I'm getting a little concerned about how the media and uh, the Democrats are now trying to spin Barr and his investigations going after the investigators as political instead of, you know, actually going after the truth and righting wrongs and, you know, going by the rule of law. They're now just making it all out to be political. That's all the media is reporting is that, oh, Trump's just going after political opponents or, you know, people he doesn't like and crap like that. I was wondering what your thoughts are about that and how can we combat that? Listen, there's only one antidote to this problem, and we got to keep uh, – uh, it's got to be a dumpster dive to find the truth. All of the information is there. All of it is forthcoming. And, you know, but because of, you know, investiga- investigatory rules and standards, you do the investigation first. Certain things now we know are the evidence is overwhelming and incontrovertible. You know, like we can look at Nadler and Democrats in the House Judiciary. They want the attorney general to break the law. They're not going to do that. The FBI blatantly lied about Christopher Steele to the FISA court because we know of two instances now where they were warned. One by the State Department employee that had enough gusto to and smarts to tell the FBI who Steele was. And the other case, of course, they they were warned by Bruce Orr. You know, all top Democrats, they, 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 they don't want this story coming out. But. If we, you know, if Barr doesn't do his job, if he doesn't stand by the rule of law, if we don't stop those people that committed a, a fraud against the court, a conspiracy to commit fraud now against the court because it was premeditated, if those people that rigged Hillary's investigation are not held accountable, if those that tried to unseat a sitting president, if those that unmasked you know, a 350 percent increase in unmasking. If we don't get to the bottom of it, then we're, it's going to continue to happen. Except next time they might be a little smarter about it and get in less trouble. Now, if Hillary ever won, we wouldn't know all of this. It would all have been buried. But I'm telling you, this is a real clear present danger to our way of life in the United States of America. Anyway, thanks, Kurt. Howard is in North Carolina on the Sean Hannity Show. What's going on? How are you? Sean, how you doing? Thanks for taking my call, and thanks for doing what everything you do every day. Well, thank you, my friend. Listen, the, uh, the FISA court judges, they, they've got me really concerned. Uh, they've been lied to over and over again. What, they have like four renewals of the warrants? And it was all done through lies, and you don't hear a word from them. Are they just as deep in the swamp as the rest of D.C.? I'm just telling you from my perspective, yeah. Yeah, listen, anybody, yeah. there's no American that gets away with with manipulating and lying to a court like this, especially when it says at the top, as Jason Chavitz said, you know, Congressman Ratcliffe saw the FISA applications. It says verified at the top of the application. It's not a surprise here. They, they, it's an unverifiable document we now know. So they're stuck and they put their signature to it and they were all warned ahead of time. So now when we eventually get to see it, and I assume probably the attorney general by now has it, certainly I would expect the inspector general has it. Certainly that's going to be a part of his report. And this woman, Kathleen Kavalek, who worked at the state department warning them and Bruce Orr telling everybody that means they did it anyway. They conspired to commit a fraud on the court to spy on an opposition party candidate after they rigged an investigation into the favored candidate, which was Hillary Clinton. They used it to rig a presidential election and then undo and unseat a duly elected president. That's what happened. That's the truth. That's what the media cannot get right because it doesn't fit their agenda. It means that Donald Trump, the whole process was designed to rig it against him, and he won anyway. And look at the results. 
All right, that's going to wrap things up for today. Hannity tonight, 9 Eastern. Look at this lineup. Trey Gowdy, Carl Rove, Ted Cruz, Reince Priebus will join us. Larry Elder, Pam Bondi. 9 Eastern, set your DVR. Hannity, Fox News. And yes, we will expose who knew what when within the deep state, the FBI, about the Steele dossier as more details become available. 9 Eastern tonight on Hannity. We'll see you then. Back here tomorrow.
square.